welcome to our first IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in the Arts Professional Learning Network session for this new season. My name is Cynthia Williams Phelps, and I'm the Director of Professional Learning for Missouri Alliance for Arts Education. And today's workshop is DEI and Delicious Dishes, Sharing Culture Through Art, DEI and Delicious Dishes and Arts Integration and EDI Story. So before we get started, um, I'd like to again say welcome everyone and we're excited you're here today. Side conversation chats are welcomed and encouraged. This presentation is recorded for future use so your smiling faces are welcome. If you don't wish um, for your image to be visible, please turn your camera off and breakout sessions interactions are not recorded. So in the chat, if you will add your name, school district, or organization, um, you can add your email address, and then also what inspired you to be here today. The IDEA Council's objective is to foster inclusive arts opportunities by examining current practice through an inclusive lens, uncovering paths to eliminate barriers leading toward inclusivity and equity, and gathering and sharing resources in support of personal and professional development in the areas related to racism, inclusion, diversity, and equity. And the mission of the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education supports, promotes, and advocates for fine arts education for the benefit of all Missourians. And I would like to welcome and introduce to you our presenters today, Stephanie Hasty, Abby Berhanu, Elizabeth Barker, and Sarah Luttrell. Thank you so much for joining us today to share your experience and expertise as art educators and your journey through the DEI and Delicious Dishes project. And we are going to turn it over to our presenters. So I will stop share. And I will pick this up to our slideshow. Here we go. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Barker, and I'm about to begin my 30th year at Lebanon High School. I just, wanted, I just wanted my colleagues to have a chance to uh, introduce themselves, so I'll go ahead and turn this over to them. Stephanie, I think you should go next. For oh, no. okay. Yes, <laughs> uh, Stephanie Hasty, um, I just finished my twenty, or getting ready to start my twenty-sixth year of teaching, and uh, I teach at Seneca Valley High School in Germantown, Maryland. My name is Abby Brahanu. I was the visiting artist that uh, was lucky enough to be invited by Liz to work with the students at Lebanon. And although I teach middle school now, I taught high school for 15 years. So it was really a really happy collaboration for me to go back and work with that age group. And then I just want to also shout out Sarah and Amy for also having me. Um, it was a great, great time. And we'll talk more about it. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Sarah Luttrell, and I'm at Waynesville High School. Elizabeth Barker asked us to collaborate with them, and we're kind of 30 minutes away, and I'm in my 12th year. And also, Amy Rushing is here. Amy, you want to introduce yourself? You have a lot of background noise. It's yeah, I'm having high. a little trouble. Yeah. I'm in an airport. <laughs> oh, we're all kind of on the go. Well, we're really happy that you're here. Um, I know you didn't have like a lot of notice. That's my fault. But Amy is uh, one of the art teachers at Waynesville and has also presented on this and helped collaborate with it. And also my colleague Eric Adams is here or what I, 
it was part of the collaboration. I don't think he was able to make it uh, tonight. Just really quickly, I wanted to acknowledge that for those of us in Missouri, we're on the traditional homelands of the Osage Nation, Missouri and Illini Confederacy. We pay respect to respect to elders, both past and present. And also just wanted to say that land acknowledge, acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historic context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Um, I am currently coming uh, to you from Santan Valley, Arizona, uh, land of the uh, Oadam people uh, and also the Apache. And um, there are probably some other groups in there too. Those are the two that come to my mind, um, especially after uh, doing some research here. That's what we need. And I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie Hasty because this entire project is her brainchild. And uh, so she originated all of this. Hello, everyone. Um, so I am trying to look at this while talking on my phone. Okay, there we go. Um, no, flipsicles. No, we do not go. Um, there we go. Okay. So Liz, if you want to go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so the whole entire thing started when we were, um, when, I, when I hosted Lit Muse at Lebanon High School. And we were wanting to do some sort of project uh, with writing and what have you. And it was right before the COVID times, is like I, I like to call them. And so we spent, uh, a couple of weeks working on it and then we were out of school for the rest of that semester but I didn't really stop thinking about like what it is we wanted to do and so I attended online um, the outright uh, conference it's a free conference in Washington DC and I didn't go there I just got on zoom like a lot of people I think did conferences a lot during that time and one of the out breakout sessions was called uh, queer cookies and this gentleman had created a group of people who wrote poetry and then he made uh, recipes to go with that poetry. And I was like, that's really cool. Right to my lip muse people, they were like, that's really cool. And so we decided to, uh, that was going to be our thing when we got back to school. Um, so we did that for a little bit. And then Liz, um, as Liz um, is wont to do, was like, hey, I have this idea. I want to turn your adventure into a Liz adventure. And um, I also have money to do it. And I'm like, I like everything you're saying. Let's do it. Also, money's good. And so that's where this came from. Thank you and to the so Art Council. Who <laughs> yeah. in this room. Exactly. Exactly. So, so we combined our kids together to create um, a little bit. And then we got some school outside of Kansas City, Northeast Kansas City High School involved. And then Liz invited, um, I don't know if this is this the last iteration or the last little bit, uh, invited Waynesville to also be part of our journey. And yeah. we just it, it goes, all it goes over a Missouri. little bit. Yeah, the, the later slides kind of go into the history a little bit more. But you started with this really cool video from Phyllis. Yes. And so then Phyllis was like, hey, we're getting kids involved we should probably uh, do something with them. So Phyllis is brilliant. And so what we did is we watched this video and this is how we started the whole entire adventure. So I'm gonna have Liz play it now. And I kind of want you, if you've not seen it before, I know that many of you have, but if you've not seen it before, be thinking about how food inspires and influences uh, Michelle Zahner, the, the lead singer of Japanese Breakfast. Do you want me to, to play all of it or part of it? Whatever suits you, whatever we've got time for. Okay. On the eve of the Lunar New Year, contributor Hua Xu is finding comfort at a store that's just like home for millions of Asian Americans. Every time I remember that my mother is dead, it feels like I'm colliding with a wall that won't give. Author and musician Michelle Zahner was 25 years old when her mother died of cancer. There's no escape just a hard surface that I keep ramming into over and over, 
a reminder of the immutable reality that I will never see her again. This half an inch tumor like destroyed my family and tore my life apart. And I think I just needed all of the space and word count and time to, to sort through that. Her story of climbing out from the depths of grief became a runaway bestseller. For a long time, you know, I couldn't remember my mom before she was sick because, you know, I had lived 3,000 miles away since I was 18, so the last concentrated period of time that we spent together was when she was ill. These are three different types of rice cakes. In the aisles of the Korean-owned grocery chain H Mart, Zahner found comfort. The beloved spam. Suddenly I wasn't thinking about my mom losing her hair or my mom losing weight. I was thinking about us in Korea eating papingsu, shaved ice with sweet red beans, and it was like a parting of a cloud, like a mental cloud. I know we are all here for the same reason. We're all searching for a piece of home or a piece of ourselves. We look for a taste of it in the food we order and the ingredients we buy. Do you feel like you're a, like a spokesperson for H Mart sometimes? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like they're their number one cheerleader. Zahner's influence is undeniable yeah. as soon as you walk through the door. Using Korean food and learning... Her Korean promotional dishes. video plays on a loop. That's, uh, That's actually the first time I've seen this on the TV. <laughs> Nearly 40 years ago, H Mart opened this store in Flushing, Queens in New York, selling mostly Korean ingredients as well as other Asian snacks and produce. These are basically like Korean Funyuns. Korean, yeah. Today, it's the country's largest Asian grocery chain, with more than 100 stores nationwide. This is the New Year section a little bit. It has become a kind of hub for Lunar New Year shopping. For Lunar New Year, yeah. you have to treat yourself to some fancy fruits. You know that produce is special when it comes with its own down jacket. Zahner is gathering ingredients to make a stew that she says works for Lunar New Year and all year round. I think the best thing that I know how to make is kimchi jjigae. It's a Korean kimchi stew, and it's kind of like the chicken soup of Korean culture. Kimchi is a staple of Korean cuisine, and its fermented, often spicy vegetables are the base of this stew. The key to really good kimchi jjigae is really old, funky, aged kimchi. It's making its presence known. It's known. Making so, its yeah. presence known. Uh, yeah, this is made with uh, cabbage. It's fermented um, with red pepper flakes, with onion and garlic, and sometimes carrots and radishes. The longer the kimchi is aged, the more flavorful the stock. It smells great already. Simmer with some onions and pork, top with tofu and scallions, and... It has such like a depth of flavor. I can't believe it just took like 20 minutes to make. It's delicious. My mom made really good kimchi jjigae. So for me, when I think of like Korean food and Korean comfort cooking and my mom's cooking, this is one of the main dishes that I always think of and was one of the most important things for me to learn how to make on my own because it was something that I really, really missed eating. There was a part of me that felt, or maybe hoped, that after my mother died, I had absorbed her in some way, that she was a part of me now. These days, Michelle Zahner is preparing to go on tour with her indie pop band, Japanese Breakfast. And she's turning her memoir into a movie. Do you see writing and cooking as a way of just, you know, bringing your mother back just for these moments? Yeah, absolutely. To, you know, have to scour memory and relive and um, see and smell and taste and hear all of those things again, yeah. it's kind of the closest that you can get to resuscitating someone. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and that's what inspired us. So if Liz wants to go to the next slide, we can sort of do the activity the kids did while talking about how that might look like in your classroom. So, I would have this on the board after watching the video. And I asked the kids, so what did you notice? And what did you note while watching the video? So does anybody want to like address that? What did you notice? And what did you note about watching when you watch this video? Yeah. I noticed that 
she talked a lot about connecting to the memory of her mother and um, going to H Mart and making that food so that it, um, so that she could reconnect to that um, time in her life, reconnect to her mother, um, and that a lot of people who also went or shopped at the H Mart, um, she felt like that they were also wanting to reconnect to that part of their identity. That's lovely. Um, thank you. I can tell you, I didn't know there were things about the Midwest that I liked until I moved here, and they don't have Highlands French onion dip. Mm -hmm. It's the saddest th thing. Nothing else tastes like Highlands French onion dip, and nobody believes that all of their dips are inferior. Anyway, um, so then I would say things like, brainstorm, what activities in your family are centered around food? So does anybody want to share an activity that your family might have centered around food? Holidays. Holidays, right. That's good. Um, I had a kid one time say, to, well, actually, just last year, Seneca Valley. Seneca Valley versus Lebanon um, is mostly Hispanic and then Asian and then Black. And then there are some white kids that I sometimes see um, because there's not very many. And also, there's 2,400 students. So we have four flights of school. And that's just one of the 25 schools in this county. So a very different experience. But when I asked them to talk about food, they all had a story in the same way that all of my Lebanon kids had a story. And I had one kid last year say, I don't really have a story about food. When my family and I don't really hang out. We don't really have family dinner. I said, so when do you eat? What do you eat? And he said, well, my dad and I will watch TV late at night and we'll, ha we'll eat uh, Cheetos, fiery Cheetos and drink Mountain Dew while we're watching TV. I go, that's the food story. That's that's it. That's your food story. That's a beautiful story. Does your dad even know that's something important to you kind of thing? And so we all have them, right? So what I would ask them to do then, which by the way, it says write or draw for seven minutes, which um, does kill. Oh, that's really good. Every Sunday? I want cheese every Sunday. Anyway, thank you for sharing. It went away. Let me see. Um, where is it? So Rachel Jameson said that they eat cheese platters with fruit and veggies and popcorn on Sunday nights for movie night. I love that. I love it. And to me, there's all these just wonderful stories. It's not just holidays. It's not just birthdays, right? Uh, I would tell my kids to write for seven minutes or to draw for seven minutes. In my English class, yes, we draw. Um, and we draw a lot. We draw all the time, frankly. Or... Um, we will use drawing to take notes. We use drawing to like do our journal entries. We use um, all sorts, all sorts of things because I believe that everybody can draw and sing and dance. Um, it's just a society. I said that some of us do it better than others, but I think it's just beautiful. Everybody can. So I would ask them to write or draw for seven minutes. And while we don't have to do that activity, I will tell you, um, Liz, if you want to go to the next slide. I want to figure out this. I will tell you that I get some really great stuff from them. When I ask them questions like, um, think about the favorite food you're eating. How does it center in the moments or events in your life? Um, kids will bring up things about like sporting events. They'll bring up things about like maybe the last meal that they had with their grandma before she died, like these kinds of things, because we all have experiences around food. So I do all five senses kind of thing. Who's present? How are you present in these events or moments? And then I ask them, um, why is this particular food important to you? And so once they start talking about their favorite foods or their favorite events, um, the, the recipe or what have you, it gets turned into um, story time and writing time. And I use that as a foundation now at Seneca Valley for the rest of the school year, like as a writing sample for them keep on coming back to and fixing and changing as we become stronger and better writers. So would anybody like to share something that they might've done or an idea that you might have to use this in your classroom? I really like the idea of engaging multiple senses to have an immersive experience, even in a classroom setting. Sometimes that's difficult and kids 
kids are enriched when they can go through all five mm -hmm. senses. Absolutely. I think with culture is with food. So, you know, around food, uh, a lot of my students will even say, I don't really feel like I have a culture. And so we, you know, we have that question of, do you eat together at the table? Do you eat in front of the TV? Do you eat alone? Do you eat in your room? Like that all is within your culture. And it's not just based off of where you were born or geographically, but I started culture projects around food. And that really does help them to kind of understand that they do have a culture and the way that they, where they eat, how they eat and so on. That's beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? I want to share, but it it's something that's coming up this Wednesday. I'm doing Sister City with 20 teenage students from Japan. Ooh. So we're doing an art project at Inglewood Art Center. So they're gonna make they're gonna do glass blowing. And in oh. my department, they're gonna do uh, mats for their bowls so this would be a good way to not um to bring their culture in as far as the bowl and to have a mat but it has american feel to it because they're origamis am i saying that correct origami yeah so the placemats are going to be origami shaped but they're going to be flat okay. oh that's fun so oh that's fun yeah, it's going to be really cool. So we got 20 kids, so we're going to split them up, 10 and 10. So 10 do glass, 10 do mats, then 10 do mats, and 10 do glass. So I'll, I'll share pictures with y'all. That'll be kind of cool. Definitely. Be my, oh, you have to. You must. This is my first big group of 20 people <laughs> at one time. Normally, I only do 12. I do 12 when it comes to our project, because you don't want to lose anybody. Right. Especially when you're doing with fabric and sewing. You can lose them real quick. Um, so yeah. we'll see how it goes. We're going to do... 10 it's total 20 we're going to do 10 and 10 so just hearing this will help me add more into my presentation well thank you feel free to take anything at all and that video is on uh cbs this morning if you need it okay that was really good too yeah she's good she's good stuff all right well i'm gonna mute myself and let uh them take over i just thought i would show you how it looks in my english classroom stephanie thank you so much so actually, Stephanie can speak to this too, because we were colleagues for 24, 25 years yeah. at yeah. Lebanon High School. So Stephanie, do you want to add to, to this? This is just kind of talking about the makeup of our school and our community, something that you can speak to, especially as somebody that moved into our community from outside and began teaching. Yeah, what I find interesting um, about Lebanon's Lebanon's demographics is um, the amount of free and reduced lunches, yet there are still kids who succeed. And uh, that seems to be, in a way I didn't recognize when I lived there, that seems to be an indicator of not success. Where, um, and so I, I bring to my school, I'm like, well, no, it doesn't matter if they're on free or reduced lunch, they can still take IB. They can still stay after school. They don't have a ride. They can walk home. They just live right across the street. Or, I, you know, like they, um, my students that I had last year were so very much, a, I couldn't go to school today because I didn't have a car. There's a bus. You could have gotten on it. You could have walked. I know where you live. You know, you don't know where I live. I saw you. I was shopping, which is why I got hired. One of the ladies talked to me about the fact that schools in suburban, urban places don't have community. And you have to build it. You have to build it. If you want kids to perform, function well, graduated 90% success rate and what have you, you got to build community. And that starts with us and with, um, you know, treating them like they're people. <laughs> so true. So I grew up in Lebanon. Um, I've been there most of my life, even though I did move into the community when I was around six. And I've done a lot of traveling and that those travel experiences, especially overseas, made me want to bring that experience back to my students when I was hired to teach at the same school I attended, because I tend to find people sort of fearful of others, people who are outside of their culture. And 
you know, my experience was, oh my gosh, the whole world is such a fantastic place and people are beautiful and there's so much to learn. And, you know, how do I bring that in? How do I break the bubble? Um, because my, my community is very homogenous. So over the years, <laughs> um, we started uh, programs to help break that bubble very intentionally. Uh, so one of them, and we've held these about seven times since the year 2002 uh, was to have a culture fair. And this is where you bring people in from the outside to your school, which is not easy to do when you're asking people like Karen E. Griffin to drive to Lebanon, Missouri through the woods from Kansas City. But we were able uh, to do this. And actually the Missouri Arts Council really helped out with helping to fund that, uh, especially this last one. And every time we did it, it got bigger. Uh, another uh, way that we've gone about breaking this bubble is through community murals. And that's also been very much um, helped along by grants from the Missouri Arts Council over the last uh, four years. And going into this next year, we're gonna continue it. This is a way to tell stories, elevate voices, bring in visiting artists, get students involved. And then what we've been doing pretty much for our entire careers is taking students on field trips. How many students can we put in a bus and take somewhere else and help them like experience the rest of the world? The beautiful thing about this country is all you have to do is go to any major metropolitan area and you can find something of the whole world there. Um, and so this picture up in the upper left-hand corner is kind of a window or a glimpse of this project in the developing phase. Um, we take students not just to art museums, of course we start there, but most of the art in the museums has a religious background of some kind. And, you know, it's a lot more interesting to talk about a cathedral and all of its parts inside a cathedral. And you really don't fully understand what you're looking at unless you have people from that community who are there speaking with their own voices about what that imagery and what that architecture means to them. Um, so it made sense to go to the Basilica Cathedral of St. Louis, and it made sense to go to mosques, synagogues, temples, um, wherever we could. And we ended up going to the Islamic Center in Kansas City um, because they also have a school. And so it allowed for these experiences where our students and their students had an hour to interact together. And it was so powerful what would happen in the space of an hour. Um, they went from fearful and uncertain to in an hour, they had new friends. And we're talking about students from both communities and they were learning from each other and they were making art together and they were tasting food together. And so it really sort of planted the seeds for, well, how can we like take this collaborative process and push it further? Because if you can do all of that in the space of an hour, what happens if it's a whole day? What happens if it's a semester? What happens if it's a year long project? And so we thought, let's let's take, let's start a, a collaboration and then let's take the kids on the adventure together. And then just kind of pulling in research. Um, this is a just reading this quote because I think it's really powerful. This is a critical time to be studying policies and practices that promote tolerance for young people who differ from one another along multiple social identities. Fostering cross group friendships can be a powerful antidote, antidote to the divisions that appear to have gripped the world as we know it. We need more research in this area, but what we have so far seems to indicate that it's just, it's, it's when you have people from different groups and they are working together and they're having like a deep experience together, that's where it like reaches people at the heart level. It's where it becomes life-changing. And just to try to uh, underline this with an enduring understanding, this is a group of students from Lebanon and Waynesville and they're in the St. Louis City Museum after, you know, they started the day as, I mean, basically strangers. And by the end of the day, they were dancing together. And we want to teach them that our differences can be embraced, not feared. We want to be open and to be curious and to wonder. 
So Stephanie, want to talk about this development? This is this was sort of the first first iteration of this project. I, I, I will also say that a number of years ago, a student introduced me to um, a YouTube video, The World is as Big or as Small as You Make It. And in that video, there were groups of students from uh, urban Philadelphia, and this was during the days of Skype, and they were um, communicating with classrooms in urban France and also somewhere in Russia. And they were sharing um, things about their lives and their music and their art. And it's really beautiful. And you know, ever since we saw that, we we were thinking, how can we create something like it? Because it looks so worthwhile. So go ahead, Stephanie and Phyllis, you were part of this as well. Yeah. So the first bit ends up by producing this lovely, lovely book. Let me see if I can find, oh, I did, I think. Yeah, find Phyllis's writing sample about her. Uh, I don't know what is this called. It's um a bowl and uh, some other things that are really great, and then a video and then a recipe that went with it. But the the main thing about this book is that. When we were creating it, we asked students to um, either write or draw something, uh, do some sort of piece of art centered around food. Um, because at the very beginning, it was all writing mostly because that's where we started it through the Lit Muse group. But we asked them to write, and then we asked them to um, then create some sort of family recipe. And it had to be a family recipe like um, Miss Phyllis's sheet cake. I, I, well, I'm showing her, casing hers because this has like this old little thing and she made it in like, was it VBS or Sunday school? Yes, it um, was Sunday school project for Mother's Day when I was a very small child, which and, was a, a favorite recipe that was then gifted to our mothers. And she's had it for, just just a mere five years when she was in Sunday school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we asked them to create their own thing. And then the little pieces of it also tells the story. Um, so that started with just Lebanon kids. Then it branched out to Northeast Kansas City High School. And we started getting all these wonderful. So getting our kids to understand they have culture and that broccoli casserole is culture and that grandma stuffing is culture was a beautiful experience. But then adding onto it um, recipes for hot pot and pho and all these other, pho, there we go, all these other things um, blended together to create what I think is, Amer is America, but also what is friggin' Missouri? I think that people forget how cool Missouri is, right? And how diverse Missouri is and, um, and how I joke, but it's so true. How Missouri is three different states in one state. It's like a north state, it's a south state, and then it's the boot hill. I don't know what we should call that. Um, but anyway, but you've got all you've got all those cultures and all these things. And I love how we with three schools combined a lot of them. Oh, thank you, Phyllis. I appreciate it. Um I just Liz, dropped in the else chat uh, a link to the book if you'd like to per peruse it online. Oh. Um, it's it's on our website that you can get there to the, to the oh. place where this is housed and it'll show you all the recipes and all the works of art that were generated by students and, and all of the wonderful editing that was done by our dear Stephanie Hasty. I did edit the Dickens right out of it. Um, this is Abby's. I love this drawing so, so very much. So, so very much um, that I had to showcase it. And let me see if I can find Liz's. I did my grandma's banana pudding because I haven't had it since she passed away in 1984 and I miss it a lot and nobody else can do it quite right. Well, not banana pudding, sorry, tapioca pudding. Uh, it's so friggin' good. Like I can taste it right now just talking about it. But I had kids who would like, I met with a family on one Sunday morning because a kid needed help writing her story. And she brought her mom, her grandma, it was me and my two friends. We ate at the rocking chair and talked about like all these things. And I said, honey, honey, it's like, what? I said, that story that you're trying to tell, you can't tell it because this is the story you should be telling. The one about your grandma's chocolate cake, the one about how you eat it every Easter. That's the story. 
you know, and the grandma was like, you're so amazing. I'll buy you breakfast. And that's why I miss living in London. <laughs> Anybody that wants a physical copy of DEI and Delicious Dishes, we can make that happen too. Just message us. Yeah, email one of us. And, and she's flipping through that. These pictures are showing the first part of our project. This is really before the MAC grant was involved in it. But MAAE was involved in helping us to coordinate with Northeast Kansas City High School. We made them part of our annual field trip to Kansas City. And then uh, thanks to uh, MAAE, they were able to come and visit us at Lebanon High School. We did some activities with the FFA and we also had a picnic at Bennett Springs State Park. So that was the beginning part of this. But I want to say that um, working with a school so far away presented its own challenges. And, you know, because I have colleagues who are art educators, we started talking and it made sense looking just 30 minutes down the road to Waynesville High School because Waynesville is a very different community uh, than Lebanon, even being so close. Stephanie, are you showing us something from the book? I am. I finally found yours. It took a minute, <laughs> but I found yours. <laughs> your spruce, your nut spruce. Oh, yeah, this is. And so she also sent us the uh, the old recipe, the original old recipe as well. Yeah. Um, but no, and I agree with Liz. It's really, really hard. Um, I, I don't think we understand how blessed we are when we're in a rural community. And there's always somebody that will throw money at you or um, somebody who doesn't mind getting up at five o'clock in the morning to drive your bus of 60 kids somewhere. And you don't really have to ask a lot of people permission to do that. And so we had a we had a genuinely hard time with, with Northeast Kansas City. Buses would arrive late to events um, or not pick up kids at all. Um, our coordinator person had to talk to so many people before she was allowed to even talk to us that it took most of the year just to get her to be on the phone with us and to get students um, Zooming with us. So something to think about if you are at a school that um, requires so much red tape. Well, it just kind of, it was definitely showing sort of some of the differences in school culture as well. Mm -hmm. So it was very eye-opening, very worthwhile. Um, and they were involved during the second year, at least during one of the field trips. So I'm going to turn this over to Sarah to talk a little bit about Waynesville High School and their demographics. I mean, you can see from the pie chart that there are some notable differences. Yeah. Hi. So I work at Waynesville High School. I'm on my sixth year here. And one of the biggest things that maybe not on this graphic is that um, at the time of this, we were 70% impacted by military. So um, I think we've gone down just a little bit lower in the 60 range, but uh, we have five generational farmers in our community, but then we also have a lot of military students as well that um, whether it's reservist, retired, or even active. So the Fort Leonard Wood area does have a big influx in what our diversity or ethnic groups are. So if you look here, we are 56 percent white and I think that is still because we are in Missouri community uh, but then we have 16 13 9 and then the other and um, one of the ones that I noticed that is it maybe even the smaller groups is the Pacific Islander groups and then several countries in Africa that we have uh, that are represented I, I taught I had one student from Nigeria that she hadn't been in the States very long. So lots of lots of um, mixed things that we have in our school. Um, but the idea is that I flourish with diversity. I love it. I like to hear all of their experiences and the places they've been. Most of our students have been out of the country, you know, and so they've been other places and experienced different things. But then with that, they can do a very good compare and contrast in cultures and different types of foods and environments. And so I was telling Liz about our experience that I had teaching with these students. And she's like, this would be great for us to collaborate. And so that's where we came on board. And you can see we're, we're about 
the same um, free reduced lunch were um, just a little bit lower than it and our population size it's only a higher by like 200 uh, so we're equivalently around the same size but it's just a different it's 30 minutes down the road and we have such a difference in that diversity so I was really excited to get on board with with Lebanon and I think no matter what our students need community and that's where Lebanon comes in. They are very strong with their community. But since these students have traveled or had to move every three years or been around, they they find a little bit reluctant to have community. And so this was a way to, to um, bring that in with them. So in the fall of, let's see, 2022, um, we started having field Zoom sessions and field trips with Waynesville. And we brought on Abby Burhanu as our uh, artist in residence. This was part of our Missouri Arts Council grant that year. And Abby um, sort of took over the visual art aspect of the project and helping students to think about the prompts from Stephanie about uh, food and culture and all of those intersections. And here she is talking uh, about a piece of artwork in the St. Louis Art Museum. I'll let Abby talk about that a little bit. Sure, Lizzie, I think there's more slideshows. I also don't want it to go um, beyond anyone. Something I'm just really sitting on is that you had three black women, Stephanie, Karen, myself, working with your students too. And so I think that seeing black leadership, um, especially women leaders, is really something special in this group for all of our students, black and brown and white students. And so Lizzie, I just wanted to say that too. Um, so this is a piece by Elena Tusi, and it's um, made out of bottle caps. He's an artist from Ghana who works in Nigeria. And a lot of his work is about colonialism. So we ended up analyzing the piece in person. And especially it's about migration of food. So he talks a lot about colonialism in the context of like, how did the alcohol get here? Because we didn't have alcohol, you know? And so talking about the bottles that came over and then all of these bottles and bottle caps kind of being strewed around um, Ghana where he grew up and just trying to make that connection to kind of a foreign presence, you know? And so um, I thought it was a really great piece to engage conversation around food and culture and how food can go beyond just like something that we eat and enjoy, you know, uh, that it can also touch on some really interesting geopolitical things, you know? And so uh, we asked the students to walk around and find, I think we said three artworks, I'm not sure three, it's been, we did a whole worksheet, um, uh, and find how food is being uh, portrayed in the work. So not just a still life, but how are people maybe engaging around food? Is there food that's symbolic of good or evil? You know, you see a lot of that in Christian art, for example. Uh, we talked about vanitas and like how some food is rotting to signify the mortality of one's life and that everything perishes and so we went just deep like you know uh, Stephanie and everyone said culture and food is connected but also looking at kind of the bigger picture around how food could represent big things in community and so um, I think there's more later Lizzie is there anything more you want me to say about this particular adventure oh, no. or do you want me to talk about my place in it because um, I've got slides for that. I just okay. wanted to make sure to, to stop and talk about what they were doing yeah, here. Absolutely. I also want to credit staff at uh, both the St. Louis Art Museum and the Nelson Atkins uh, for their work in uh, preparing activities for our students as they were doing this. Um, both of those institutions were really like a great um, grounding for launching this project. Yeah, um, and just so I'm clear about that piece, that is just bottle caps that have been flattened and wi wired together and it looks like textile, but it's not. So. I do wanna make one note. Um, if you look in the top right, we went, we started in Zoom in our classrooms meeting up and then we met up in St. Louis 
and we went to the Basilica. But at the end of the night, the Ethiopian restaurant, after meeting on Zoom and then meeting at the field trip, doing the field trip all day long where we're immersing our students together. By the end of the night, you can see them there. They're, that's mixed school there. And they're, they put some music on and they were um, videotaping themselves, dancing, and just, you know, we, we did not... We did not force that or we just allowed that to happen organically. And it was just a beautiful thing by the end of the night that we seen. I just wanted to note that there. It's really the energy in the air was really clear that we were on to something here. And that was just the beginning of that particular school year. We're now um, beginning our third year with our partnership with Waynesville and our fourth year um of projects related to the beginning of this. So this is just showing us meeting on Zoom. Um, it's not ideal, but it's definitely a way to get things started and to get kids thinking and interacting so that they anticipate meeting in person. And uh, this is one of the field trips to Kansas City. I think that first year we've got more of them. Um, went to the American Jazz Museum and uh, here they're at Studios Inc. and they were interacting with artist Harold Smith and they were interacting with artist Vivian uh, Blewett. And every, um, I could tell so much, but I know we're like limited in time. Every one of these field trips ends with a meal somewhere that we can't have in Lebanon. Now, some of the foods not available in Lebanon are available in Waynesville, but in this case, we went and ate um, at the Sahara restaurant, which is a Palestinian owned place in Kansas City. Oh, I didn't really need to play that, but uh, that's like a group of Northeast Kansas City students um, making TikTok videos with Lebanon students. Even monetary things, it's about the things that you don't have to consider. Don't have to talk about. You don't have to worry about whether or not somebody's gonna think that you've broken into somebody's house because you're walking down the street with a hood on your head in a neighborhood that somebody doesn't know who you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Trayvon Martin was only 16 years old and he was killed for walking down the street. Tamir Rice was only 12. I'm sure all of you are over the age of 12. Yeah. Tamir White Rice was only 12 years old when someone pulled up in a, a police officer, pulled up in a park and shot him dead for having a toy gun, a toy at 12. So that's just kind of showing that Lebanon and Waynesville students were actually having some pretty in-depth conversations with the artists um, as we're going to these studios and um, interacting with people. It's so it's so much more than just going to the art museum, which is beneficial in and of itself, but these other things that we're doing, bring it to the next level. And then having an artist in residence, working with them like Abby, just absolutely amazing. I'm gonna have to like flip through these a little bit uh, quicker, but this is uh, Kansas City in 2023. We start at the Islamic Center. We go to the Nelson. Um, we actually went to, um, Vulpus Bastille, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, correctly. Karen um, Lewis Griffin was there. Uh, she has charisma like few people I've met in my life. Every time I've brought students to her, they come in, she's talking to them, they're lining up to hug her afterwards. I've never, I, I have nothing to, I have nothing to compare her to. She's amazing. And then um, they didn't want to leave. Yeah. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to hear more. And she's interacting with them. She's showing them her artwork. She's telling stories. Uh, and so she's here today, she's here today. And she's here today, which is just amazing. <laughs> so, like the opportunity to bring these students together into these spaces where they can interact and learn uh, from people. I mean, this lady at the mosque isn't an artist, but you know, she's shedding light on the imagery in the building and the architecture and how it's organized, which is so, un it's so critical to understanding what you're looking at and understanding um, other cultures, which in order to understand cultures, you have to first understand something about what your culture is. So I think this is a part that I'm going to turn over to Abby because Abby can best illuminate how she walked through students through this process. 
as studio artists. Just fine too. But um, so to add to what um Stephanie has mentioned, Sarah's mentioned, it really was getting the kids to know that they have a culture to start with, because whiteness is a a a power system, right? And so within whiteness gets washed out people's culture and those things that they value about themselves. So we talked a lot about how culture is really related to your memories and experiences as well. So that's why when we, if, if we ever insult another person's culture or not acknowledge it or not have an honoring conversation around it, it's really hits deep, you know, because it's not just about the food. It's not just about the music. You know, it's not just about the dance. The arts are a way we express what's important in our memory and experiences, right? That we value about our culture. And so um, we looked at Ethiopian coffee ceremonies, for example, that the coffee ceremony isn't just about drinking the coffee. It's really about coming together in community you know, and having the experience of chatting about the daily gossip or whatever was happening that day um, and to unwind and decompress. And that it's a very ceremonial experience where people are walking around with the the coffee bean from the, the start. It gets roasted and then the smells, Phyllis, you were talking about the multi-sensory experience. The smells are a big part of how we enjoy that experience, the, the sound of the roasting. And there's always incense going in the back Background, so you smell the smoke of the incense. So it's a whole experience. And so I, I, I think it's either on this slide or the next one, Lizzie, I showed them Ethiopian cultural uh, or Ethiopian. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, like yeah, apparently... that was just me introducing that. And I don't know if the, I don't know where that, yeah, there it is at the bottom. Lizzie, if you just want to play it and mute it, you know, I can talk a little bit about it. I don't know if you're able to mute it. Yeah. There you go. And so roasting it and that and the, the point of this wasn't just to share my culture with them, which I'm very proud of, you know, and it's tied to my memory and my identity and who I am, and to express that they all have something to be proud of just like that. But it's also to show them that making like, the interaction around food isn't just about the food consumption, it's about the process, it's about the ingredients, and it's about that multi sensory experience. Zauner, you know, one of the things that stood out to me when I watched that video, and Stephanie, I love that video, um, is the process of her making the food, you know, and so when she talks about her mother and being, you know, re res resuscitating her, as she says, she's resuscitating her because smells and those multisensory experiences jot up memories, you know, they go right back and take us right back. So it's not just about the taste of the food, but it's also about the experience of making it, the utensils, all of those things we talk about later and then I made a, a woman making Ethiopian coffee <laughs> for my piece which we've been passing back and forth between um <laughs> Lebanon high school and uh, I still want to fix that around at Waynesville high school it's <laughs> also the work has been shown at Missouri State University and the Laclede County uh library Oh, thank you. And the kids' works are so amazing. So I wish I could see them. I saw them in person, but I need to show see them in a show. So we uh, came up with stations. I'm a tab or choice art teacher. So I believe in as much choice as possible for students. And so even though in this case, we're dictating the theme with a lot of openness and how that can be interpreted, we wanted to give the kids the choice of how they wanted to interpret this in their work. So we had a food station where we had um, spices and stuff. Um, we had collage photo station and we had a collaborative area if they wanted to sit together and make one work of art together. We had a sculpture section where they can get messy with plaster um, and Eric was doing the photography in the other room and doing photography all the time. He's an amazing photography teacher. And then we had draw paint um, stations as well. Um, and then we set it all up for them to, to kind of choose as they as they wish. <laughs> Let's see what are you doing to me? All right. I'm really sorry. Okay, here. Okay. And then we looked at theme, anchor themes. And um, 
So instead of just throwing them in and say, talk about food, we talked about food in the context of like cultural heritage, you know, traditions around holidays. Phyllis, she talked about that, um, how it involves relationship and community building. So if it's around food, how does that take place? And what, how does the food then become the catalyst for that? How about the place, maybe the place it's made, the place it comes from, the migration of the food, um, anything to do with storytelling around food, the cooking and cleaning that process that we talked about, awakening all of the senses, which we touched upon and then again the the tools that we use to make art and that's very much tied to visual art because a lot of what we know about ourselves as human beings is really from the pottery and food um, I, uh, items that people used you know and then we can say oh they ate rice because this is something that you would use to to store rice or oil and so we know a lot about our history as a, a people from just even the utensils that were used and the kitchen items. And then we talked about storytelling. So we looked at this piece I found online and we said, what's the story? Who is this person? What is what is the story around this food? And they analyzed that because of time. I'm going to rush through this a little bit. We talked about a lot. <laughs> and then they started making it um, and using some of the prompts that Stephanie had put out. And then we started making art. So it was kind of a choice. Like I said, all the everything they needed, all the materials were out and they got to choose however they wanted to approach this. I emphasized a lot of like how important it is to think outside of the box. So if you've always been painting, maybe throw in a little mixed media in there, go into some collaging, maybe do some sculpture. I think we showed them like basic plastering and maybe Sarah and Amy had probably done that with them already. So they had kind of an, uh, an assortment of media, sometimes from the dollar store. I went to the dollar store and bought aluminum foil, uh, wallpaper, kitchen wallpaper, all kinds of things from the dollar store. And they use that to uh, add to their food. And um, I know I was able to bring some of these Korean desserts from a Korean shop in St. Louis. And then Lizzie, if you want to add where some of the other food came from. Well, in Lebanon, <laughs> yeah, that, in Lebanon, we we were giving them a uh, pizza from our uh, most famous mom and pop shop, Cornerstone in Lebanon. And then Sarah, where were you getting this delicious kimbap? Uh, so we we went to Bulgogi House. There's like three different Korean restaurants just in our small town of St. Robert. And uh, so Bulgogi House was able where we got our kimbap. And then we also had Rusi Six Tacos. And they had a variety of different tacos. So, you know, we have heavily Hispanic and Asian culture in St. Robert for restaurants. Yeah. So we and ate a lot. In the Korean market. Yeah. As we, we made art. And so here are some of the pieces the students made. And what I love about it, again, is that they pushed their boundaries, tried to mix unusual materials together along the way, sometimes spices and things like that as well within their food. So Lizzie, if you want to flip through it, since we have one minute, just to honor some time. So here, um, Kyle, is that the student's name? Uh, this is Matt. Matt, uh, I'm Kyle, sorry. Guys. Kyle's right here. Okay, Kyle would yeah, use spices in their food, which was really, it was very multi-sensory, <laughs> let's just say. So you could smell it just as much as, um, and feel the texture. And then the other one, the one to the Matt's piece was also really beautiful. I love that they pushed the boundary. We talked about how the edge is there, but it doesn't have to be. And so they can go beyond the edge and kind of go into the world however they want with the material. So I love that Matt did the fork and knife and kind of extended it beyond the frame. And, and it, it was accepted into Drury's Best of the Midwest show, I think. I think it was this one. I love it. And Matt told me they've never used newspaper in their art before. And so I showed a lot of examples of just kind of unusual uses of media and mixed media and things like that. So we could just flip through it. The student was real special and really sweet to know, to get to know her. Right. Um, this is one of my favorites because the student used the packaging from the foods that we brought from the Korean shop. <laughs> so, um, and Lizzie, you want to add? Uh, well, she's just talking about how this piece is called, Have You Seen Bullet Train? Mm -hmm. And this is just about her experience of going to the movies. Mm -hmm. she's, very, she's very blunt about it, too. Hi, hello. So this is uh, this is grass working on uh, she, they called it pasta world. 
<laughs> we really like when we put this together, we just loved the students and their stories so much <laughs> that we really could extend this quite a ways beyond this, but we're trying to honor everybody's time. So this is just Here's some of the wallpaper from the dollar store. I um, love seeing some of the artists with the art. I have never seen this before. Oh, I really? have worked with the book like forever oh. and ever and ever. I never saw the people that went with the book. This is fun. <laughs> this video up here was just catching a moment of both Lebanon and Waynesville students sort of working together, completely absorbed in what they were doing, sharing music, uh, just so many moments like that where it's, you know you're on the right track and you've got something pretty beautiful going on. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, every kid recognizes they have a culture, you know, and they have something to bring. And there's like this very equitable experience in that way. Um, and kind of this dispelling of hierarchical, like um, cultural exceptionalist thinking, you know, um, and we kind of all showed up like knowing that everything we had to bring was important, you know, and that no one's cultural experience is more important than another person. So there was a lot of exchange of conversation too that kind of added to that value. That was an artist statement. Yeah. I'm just kind of moving through this kind of quickly. Again, that you know, Abby really uh, had the students like push the boundary of the materials and introduce other materials to great effect. You all do a great job teaching them because they were really open and did some amazing works. Really. This is a group, they're working on artwork, but then they also learn that they play the same video game and they're just really very, very excited about their shared experiences. It's better when they explain it, but again, just trying to honor your time. If you want a copy of the slideshow, there's a lot of artifacts and resources linked here. So, it's a pretty good note to end on. Mm -hmm. I apologize if I've accidentally like talked over anyone, um, just trying to like move all of this through in the space of an hour. And I couldn't be more blessed to work with all of my colleagues and Phyllis at Missouri Alliance for Arts Education and um, artists like Karen Griffin. You know, I miss Stephanie as she's moved to another school, but here we are still working together, Abby and Sarah, just so many, um, so many things to be grateful for and excited to continue this. Last year, Sarah led the journey between Lebanon and Waynesville working as an artifact ambassador. And I just want to add really quickly, because Liz is always shouting the praises of everybody around her, but I just want to really highlight how exceptional of an art educator she is and a community builder. I'll I've second that. that. Yeah, I was going to say, I have never seen anything like it. Stephanie, thank you for <laughs> being a brainchild. You two make such a, a golden like duo. And um, I'm just so grateful to you, Liz. Like the community you bring and fold into your own is incredible. And I love being a yeah. part of it. And I just loved the kids and your kids too, Sarah and Amy. And I really bonded with them. And it was such a, it was such a rejuvenating experience for me. So I want to thank you for having me. And thank you for your vision to always dream big, Liz, because what you're doing is going to reverberate reverberate like throughout time really throughout all the, all the kids that you have brought this experience to so well I done. Feel it already is and it there's none of it that would be possible without the contributions of everybody that's been such an important part of it yeah. we're so grateful to the Missouri Arts Council and the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education and just like everybody for supporting us in this because uh, sometimes in our individual schools um, we don't feel that support necessarily at the most local level uh, but when we launch these things forward the, there's real buy-in from the students and there's real buy-in from the community and once you have that it's unstoppable 
Touche, if I can add, Elizabeth, one of your students, Taylor, I believe, is is going is coming to KCAI, and she's asked me to mentor her. So this this found this foundation you have built. Now we're going to build a legacy on your behalf. So just so you know, she's I'm trying to get her housing here at Inglewood Arts. So we're trying to get her someplace to stay, and I connected her with a professor at um, Deanna Scadell at um, um, MCC, who's an art professor. So we'll we'll keep you posted. Uh, we'll take I care of your baby. Care what she does, yeah, take care of that baby. <laughs> we'll She's take care of your baby. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you all for your willingness to present this project. Um, what an amazing, powerful collaboration. It is, it's just been um, such a, a wonderful experience to hear all of the things that you have been doing in these communities to, to build um, community and collaboration. Um, so thank you again for being here. Thank you for your time. I could listen to you for two more hours, um, but I will go ahead and um, share and wrap up our session today. Um, if you um, would like, um, if you need a continuing ed certificate, um, please um, contact me at Cynthia.Phelps at moaae.org. And I also put our eval form into the chat. Um, your feedback is greatly appreciated. So please share your feedback, suggestions, and comments. Um, again, if you have questions, contact me at Cynthia.Phelps at moaae.org and please tell your friends because we love to build this IDEA community. Thank you so much for setting this up and, and having us. We love talking about this. Absolutely. We're hoping that this will be a template um, and, and an aid in helping other educators do collaborations like it. And it may not doesn't have to be the same thing. It could, but the idea is to uh, get get people together building relationships across cultures. And it can start small and it still can have a great deal of value. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.